Well, such is the anger at Moscow's military action. Ukraine's defence minister has referred to Russians as orcs, of course, referencing the fictional monsters in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, while another of the country's top public figures has even called for a massacre of the Russian people. Earlier, my colleague Yunan O'Neill got more details from RT's Paul Aslia. There was a Ukrainian journalist who gave a report live, and in that report he said, as a journalist, I need to be impartial, I need to be balanced... OK, one doesn't have a problem with that. But he said, seeing that the Russians are branding me and Ukrainians Nazis, I'm going to quote from Adolf, Adolf Eichmann. And he, and, and he went on to argue that Eichmann said, if you're going to murder people, you need to murder the children, because otherwise they will grow up and seek some kind of revenge or want to avenge the death of their parents. And he said, well, the Ukrainian military cannot murder Russian children because they're bound by international law and, and rules of law, but I am not part of the military and therefore I can. And I think it's worth quoting. He said, yeah. when I get the chance to take Russian lives, I will not hesitate to do so. I will do everything I can so that neither you nor your children will ever be able to live on this land. And he goes on, I mean, the, the terminology, you are trash that must be wiped off the face of the planet. And if any Ukrainian has the chance to crush your bones, slit your throat, kill and smother Russians, well, I hope they at least kill one of them. So, so quite emotive language that I think by any norms would not be acceptable. Much later, he did come forward and apologize, but the apology was to the extent that he said, well, what I said was unacceptable. We are humans. We as Ukrainians are humans. We are not like the Russians who pray for genocide. So even that apology is a little bit questionable. We are seeing the same kind of sentiment being expressed by officials in Kiev. So their, their statements are not as extreme and not as dramatic. But as you mentioned, this is what the Ukrainian defense minister had to say. And it in itself um, is quite emotive. Let's take a listen. Mm. Kiev, one of the most beautiful cities in EU today, looks like a frame of apocalypse movie. Sumy, Kharkiv, Mariupol, it's terrible. This is what the Russian world carries with it. Deaths of people, destruction not only cities but democracy, rights, freedoms. They aren't Slavs, they're orcs, but we'll win. It was published by the Ukrainian State Body for Historic Research, which one would assume would have some kind of authority. It went so far as to publish nine arguments uh, that, that are supposed to ultimately lead to the conclusion that Ukrainians and Russians are not brothers, as everybody likes to, to say. Mm. And it certainly is strange to many people to de facto separate the two nations, because if you look back in history, they, they really are much more similar than they are different. And he went on with his arguments, and the most interesting one is actually the ninth one, where he spoke about the origins of the differences, going back as far as the seventh century, where he made the point that you touched on, that Ukrainians are Slavs, but he said Russians are Slavs and Ugrofins, and the conclusion was that Ukrainians are kind of good and Russians are evil. Now, as you can well imagine, there was some kind of response to that from viewers. Um, one said, well, you're pushing this theory that we're pure, you're not pure, and that has throwbacks to the Second World War. Another person saying, well, can you point out physical characteristics that would help me distinguish between a Russian and a Ukraine? And my personal favorite is someone saying, I know you guys are trying really hard not to be Nazis, but I'm gonna have to ask you to try a little harder. And following that response, the, the body added a PS to their nine arguments, which said that what they meant by pure origin was not that some tribes are better than others, mm. which in itself doesn't seem an, a very um, convincing argument, but just that the roots between Ukrainians and Russians are different in terms of folk culture, social traditions, etc. So again, back to the topic of rhetoric, back to the topic of where, where it leaves us, yeah. it certainly is worrying. Well, for more on this, let's cross live to political analyst and journalist Nico House. Nico, welcome to the program. So Ukraine's yeah. president has compared Russia uh, to Nazi Germany back in World War II. Now, it's obviously no secret that this military intervention has been widely condemned. But what do you make of that comparison? I feel like it's just uh, it's ignorantly ironic, considering how much damage the Russians took from the Nazis, how... Uh, you know, according to the majority of the world, Russians are responsible for defeating the Nazis, whereas on the other hand, of course, the U.S. and the NATO powers that are currently assisting Ukraine, accused of being largely ran by Nazis to a large degree, uh, they were known for allowing funding of Nazism, right? We're talking about Ford, GM, GE, uh, Prescott, Bush. All these people were literally known for 
funding Nazism, much like they're being accused right now. So I just find it ironic that after, once again, thousands and thousands of not uh, only uh, Russians, but East Ukrainians have been killed by these neo-Nazis, proud, you know, proud neo-Nazis, that the response to this, the response to the constant threat to Russian security is deemed as quote unquote Nazism, but not the people who actually fund Nazis. Mm -hmm. Well, and talking of which, in the past, the, uh, the Western media has criticized the rise of far right groups in Ukraine. There seems to be a bit more quiet now during this conflict. Are you surprised by that? I am surprised because actually in 2017, the United States Congress thought it was such a big problem, the funding of Nazism in, uh, in West Ukraine, that they forbade funding Nazis. They literally passed legislation stopping it from happening. Now, clearly that, that legislation is being ignored, but, but I, do, I, I find it surprising, uh, or at least I would have, uh, but, you know, you do a, de a deep enough dive into the history of the U.S., you find that they've kind of been embedded with Nazis this entire time. And oftentimes when the United States and their State Department media arms speak, uh, you find out it's mostly projection. They're truly guilty of what they accuse others of being guilty of. Mm -hmm. And now moving on to the media and social media. Recently we had a Ukrainian TV host called for violence against Russian people and especially children. Um, and then we had Facebook recently lifted a ban on the use of violent words towards Russian soldiers in Ukraine. Um, now, we have to mention that Ukrainian TV host did apologize for, for those words. But are you concerned by this trend at all? Uh, I'm extremely concerned by it because, uh, I mean, we had a president suspended from all social media, banned really, from all social media perceived call to action that actually never really happened, but they just said he should have known what he was saying. So Trump has been banned from all social media. But in this particular case, Facebook is saying, well, in the case of calling for violence against Russian soldiers, or even in the case of calling for the literal assassination of another nation's president, well, this is fine. Mm -hmm. Which once again shows how inconsistent the big tech uh, oligarchy is they're not they're not uh, applying any type of principles unless it's protect you know protect the powers that be uh, of the United States and the West. Um, but it's even more dangerous because, I mean, it, does it stop at Russia? What, who's the next person that's going to upset the United States or upset the NATO powers? Where Facebook temporarily allows a ban on are uh, temporarily allows calling for violence on those individuals. Where, do, well, where does it stop? And I think a lot of us have seen a lot of that the last four or five years, but never having it ex explicitly being allowed like it is in this particular case. Yeah, indeed, it is interesting to see where they do draw that line. Um, Ukraine's defense minister has compared Russians with orcs and obviously but putting emotions around his own country aside. Is that the kind of language you expect from such a high level official? Uh, the, I mean, any high-level official that the United States approves of, I imagine, considering, I mean, I'm, well, I live in a country that's ran basically by children who didn't get enough love from their mothers. Uh, and when you have world leaders comparing, uh, you know, soldiers to orcs, it's so it's like, so Russian soldiers are orcs, then what would you consider the members of the Azov Battalion, who are literal Nazis, holding Ukrainians and Russians, uh, you know, as human shields? in a Donetsk region, in other regions of the Ukraine, like not letting people leave, their own people, that they're supposedly fighting Russia to save. What do you call those type of people? And why, I might ask, because everybody keeps saying that, uh, you know, Ukraine isn't all Nazis, which we all know. But why do we not hear anybody from the Ukraine? No leadership in the Ukraine has as much as condemned the Nazism that we do know as president. Mm -hmm. Nobody has ever explained why the Azov Battalion has been rewarded by being an official arm of the Ukrainian military after helping to overthrow an entire government. And none of these current officials, these officials after the government that came after the government that the U.S. installed, why have they not condemned the Nazism there? Mm -hmm. Since we, so we don't have to say everybody's Nazis, but why haven't you condemned the Nazism that has power? Mm -hmm. Just taking a, a quick step back and looking at the overall sort of coverage of this war, uh, for example, the Italian press recently published a photo claiming to show the devastation caused by Russian strike in Kiev, 
But Russia's foreign ministry spokeswoman is claiming it's in fact pictures of a Ukrainian attack on Donetsk. This is just one of many examples of sort of confusing coverage. We've had footage from computer games uh, allegedly depicting mm -hmm. the war in Ukraine. Now, they say the first casualty of war is the truth. And I guess I'm not really expecting a concrete answer from you here, but how do you even go about sorting fact from fiction in a conflict like this? Uh, well, it's actually pretty easy. So as a journalist, you generally go to social media, and if they allow it to be printed for a long period of time, then it's probably a lie, right? We, saw, we had a lot of people claiming Russia bombed a hospital, Russia bombed a this, Russia killed these people, and it turns out somebody had a response showing the truth with a real article or a primary source saying, actually, no, it's the opposite, and this is the Ukraine bombed these people, Ukraine's holding these people as human shield, et cetera, et cetera. Like, so generally, if it's a lot on social media and it doesn't get challenged by uh, the big tech oligarchy, then it's probably a lie and you should go and research and figure out if the opposite is true because it usually is. Just like what you just explained here today. Like what they they claimed that Russia has a propensity to, uh, to uh, uh, use chemical weapons, which is like, it's insane being that I'm from the United States and we're the only country, to my knowledge, that completely ignores the Geneva Convention and allows chemical weapons to be used on our own people during protests. We're not even allowed to use the chemical weapons that we use on our people during protests overseas, engaging another country's military. But we're worried about, uh, that we're supposedly worried that Russia's going to use the weapons that supposedly weren't there from labs that didn't exist a week and a half ago, and so they admitted they existed, right? If the media, allow, social media allowed that to persist and never once said, hey, you can't print this stuff because you got guys got caught lying. Instead, they allowed it. So you have to assume that at that point, if they allow all these people to claim that it's going to be true, then it's probably the opposite. And it's probably the finger should be pointed at the person doing the, accusa the accusing this particular case. So that's, that's generally how I go about figuring it out. If the news allows it, if media, if social media allows it, then I start researching the opposite okay. to figure out that's the truth. Instead. Well, well, Nico House, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Nico House, political analyst and journalist, thank you very much for your take on the ongoing war and words of the uh, conflict in Ukraine. Thank you. No problem, man. Thank you.